Well, good morning. Just a little different today. Yeah, we are delayed a bit because of a power outage in this area, but we're determined to continue our live stream. So we are live streaming from the outside today. So uh, pray for us, and uh, again, uh, let's prepare for worship. And we thank God for this opportunity, even uh, to be outside. Such a beautiful day. We thought we would be without music, but if you can hear, the birds are singing uh, in the background, and we are so appreciative. So what I'm going to do, I'll share a scripture and a prayer, and we're blessed today to have our speaker, my friend, uh, the former pastor here at the Encanto Southern Baptist Church, Dr. Don E. Connolly. So our scripture reading today will be taken from Ephesians. The second chapter, verses 13 through 16, where it's written, written, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle walls of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, uh, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both uh, to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to, uh, putting to death the enmity. Let us pray. Most gracious Father, we thank you for being the awesome God that you are, that even, Father, in challenging times such as these, even without power, you allow us, Father, to come together uh, for worship and to share that worship today via live stream. We thank you for bringing us who were once distant from uh, you near by the blood by your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for uh, making him our peace, Father, uniting us as one, removing the wall of hostility that divided us. Oh, Father, you made for us a way out of no way, uh, demonstrating your love for us like no other. I pray that we will seek to live lives, Father, demonstrating our love and our appreciation for what you've done. I uh, pray uh, preaching power today for uh, our preacher, Dr. Conley. Use him, Father, to challenge our hearts, to open our eyes to your nearness, to penetrate our hearts in a way that we surrender to your will and your way. Thank you, Father, for this day, for this moment. Have your way, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus, we pray today. Amen. We'll now have our speaker come, Dr. Don E. Connolly. Thank you, Pastor Pope, and uh, thank you, uh, Encanto, for your graciousness and your hospitality. Uh, we know that uh, there is not a power outage in heaven, so this is a good uh, object lesson for us. Uh, when we have a power outage here, things can go bad. But just think, if we have a power outage in heaven, things would really, really be bad. So. Praise the Lord for all things. And uh, it's going to be a little noisy. I'm going to try to speak loud. And uh, I hope the birds keep singing because that's kind of a, a, a symbol that God is with us. Uh, but today, the message that uh, the Lord has laid on my heart is about reconciliation uh, and healing the spiritual divide. And I've taken it from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 11 to 21. So uh, if you have your Bible, please turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 11 to 21 i'll give you a few moments to get your bible uh, there at home and uh, to turn to second corinthians chapter 5 verses 11 to 21 i'll be reading from the text that i study that's the new american standard bible and i'll read slowly so that you might be able to follow me along uh, in the translation that you have before you but always carry your, your Bible with you to hear a Bible lesson or a sermon, whether it's on live stream or in a church. You need to have the Word of God with you so that we might be like the Berean brothers to be able to examine the text to make sure that what I'm saying is true. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 to 21 reads this way. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your conscience. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we were beside ourselves, it's for God. If we are sound of mind, it's for you. 
for the love of God, the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us, that it's you and I, the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Will you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge that you are the God that heals us, the God has saved us, and the God who provides for us and protects us. We thank you for this opportunity. In spite of the setbacks technologically, we know that you're still on the throne, that your message will go forth. We just thank you for your power. In Jesus' name, amen. I chose this theme because I'm seeing in our world today, especially in our culture, in our country, there needs to be a healing of the spiritual divide. And so uh, I chose 2 Corinthians uh, to, uh, to speak to this issue because the church at Corinth had several issues going on. Uh, number one, they had a lot of cliques of factions where uh, people were uh, competing with who was right and who was wrong. And then there was the other issue of them uh, going to court over one another when they had differences rather than selling the differences within the congregation. And then there was the uh, notion of the young man who in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 who was put out of the church uh, because he was uh, doing an adulterous thing with his father's wife. And so they've been having trouble forgiving and they've been having trouble trying to find reconciliation. And so I chose this passage because in our culture today, in our country and, and in the world, there is a lot of division. And in this division, there's no one taking the responsibility to begin and start the process of reconciliation. So indeed, we do live in a divided world. In fact, separation has been used in scripture to describe the relationship between God, our creator, and mankind, the crowning of creation, since the fall of Adam in Genesis chapter three. The problems that we have, that have plagued mankind since the garden has all been uh, attached to labels of several consequences uh, out of the fall. First of all, in our time, we use words such as genocide, war, racism, holocaust, sexual perversion, abortion, murder, and so on. These are all used to describe the symptoms uh, but they do not identify the cause. Now the Bible only offers one word to describe our situation, and that word is said. Amen. And I always capitalize it, capital S, capital I, and capital N, because I want it to stand out among all the small sins that we commit, yes. because the sin that's being spoken of here is the nature that we have inherited from our father Adam. That is what we call the flesh, the nature that we've inherited from him. And so the Bible offers uh, us solutions, not only uh, to identify the problem, but that solution is Jesus Christ. So my objective today is to encourage every believer who hears this message to remember that we are ambassadors for Christ. And we've been called and given a ministry of reconciliation. Now reconciliation is possible on two levels, namely reconciling man to God. And remember, God did not move. It's man that moved. And man had to be brought back in the congruence of reconciliation to God. And God took the initiative to bring man back to himself. And then also there is the initiative that we can take in the 
reconciling people to people, particularly brothers and sisters in Christ, we should always seek to be reconciled, as well as letting the world know that they can be reconciled to God. So I present three points uh, in my discussion uh, so that it be, might be clear in my desire to see churches, churches flourish and impact the communities in which God has planted them. We don't have much impact today in the local church. Many of us are competing for dollars from our government. Many of us are trying to be politically correct. Uh, many of us are seeking political favor and, and social standing, but not many of us are standing up on the word of God and allowing the spirit to speak truthfully and clearly that the situation that we're in is dire and we need dire uh, solutions. And the only solution was the one that God gave for us 2,000 years ago on the cross in, in, on Calvary, where Jesus died for our sins, that we might be forgiven of our sins. And so uh, I want to just uh, examine these three issues, and then I'm going to be finished. First of all, sinful man has to be reconciled to God. And as I said before, God did not move. Man had to be brought back uh, in reconciliation to God. And then Jew and Gentile, and remember now the issue in the Old Testament was God's chosen people did not do exactly what God called them to do. And so he started the body of Christ in the New Testament, which was empowered in Acts chapter 2. And so Jew and Gentile had to be reconciled so that we might be in one body. And then the gospel of Jesus Christ is the message of reconciliation. So first of all, sinful man must be reconciled to God. And so the first question I think we need to ask is how did we get here? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, where God took Adam as he uh, planted the garden east in Eden, he brought him up and he gave him some marching orders. He said, the Lord took the man and put him into the garden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. God has given us marching orders. The, in fact, the scriptures tell us later on that the soul that sinned, it shall surely die. And uh, he was telling uh, Adam the same thing. The moment that you rebel, the moment that you become disobedient, you will surely, surely die. And we know that the death that, that Adam uh, experienced at that particular time when he uh, fell in the, in the Garden of Eden was his separation between himself and his God or his creator. And we see that given to us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eye, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So we see that man tried to cover up, tried to hide his sinful condition, but it did not work. Later on, God had to kill an animal to make clothing for them so that they could truly be clothed upon themselves. But in all of that, God was patient with man from Genesis chapter three to Genesis chapter six. And we find that uh, uh, God took a drastic measure in verse five of Genesis six, it says this, then the Lord God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And we know that the result of God's observation there is what we call the flood, where he killed all things that had breath in them with the exception of those lives, both animals and humans, that were in the ark. And that God let us know that he will not tolerate sin for very long. So it only took three chapters. If we look at that in the, uh, the span of years, it took hundreds of years before God uh, allowed himself to take that drastic step. But even at that, after it was all over, God gave us a sign of hope. In Genesis chapter 9, he talks about, I set my bow in the cloud. Whenever you see a rainbow in the clouds after a rain or where there's high humidity, that's God's promise 
that you will never ever have to experience the flood as another judgment uh, for our sin. And we know that later on in the book of Revelation, we're going to see that all things will be burned up. So it won't be a flood, but it will be the fire next time. So God said he made that covenant with Noah and you and I, we can experience that and see it in our day and time whenever it rains. Now God's final solution was given to us in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, where it says this, and I will put my enmity between you and the woman, He's talking to the serpent now, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel, giving a promise that there's one coming who will overcome and defeat and gain the victory over Satan, sin and death, and he will be himself killed permanently put into the lake of fire that we see in the closing chapters of the book of Revelation. And so that came to fruition 2,000 years ago. Luke chapter 23, verse 46, shares this with us as Jesus was hanging on the cross. And Jesus, that is after he had taken the bitter wine, cried out with a loud voice and said, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. Having this, he breathed his last. And then John goes further and gives us the conclusion of the matter in John chapter 19, verse 30, where it says, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And then Matthew gives us the climactic act of God's uh, approval and God's acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, And Jesus cried out again and with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Now it's curious that the earthquake would have torn the veil from the bottom to the top. But God in his uh, recognizing that now I have an opportunity to bring man to myself, he tore it from the top to the bottom, letting us know that God understands now and he knows that Jesus had made full payment for the penalty of our sins and now we can be reconciled. And then we got the issue next of the Jew and the Gentile uh, are being reconciled into one body. First of all, I want to say that Jesus established for us a relationship and he did not come to establish a religion. If he was to do a religion, he would have done it and we would all would be Jews, but we have not uh, been given a religion, but a relationship. Ephesians chapter two, verse 14 says this, for he himself, that is Jesus is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. We saw that in the dividing of the veil. Uh, in verse 15, it says, abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one man, that is Jew and Gentile, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God, that is reconcile Jew and Gentile as one body to God through the cross by making or having put to death the enmity thereof. In Romans 5, 8 through 11, God says this uh, to Paul as he relates it to the Romans. Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 8 to 11. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And now not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we have now received the reconciliation. Paul comforts the polytheist who believed that the only way they could please their God was to do things the way that God wanted it to. But here, Paul is relating to them that the God that we serve is the God that himself took the initiative to make the reconciliation possible. So God is no respecter of persons. We see that in Acts chapter 10, where Peter was sent to, uh, where, the, where, uh, the, where Peter was at the house of Simon the Tanner, uh, and these men were sent from uh, Cornelius uh, to relate to him that he'd had this vision to send for Peter. 
And Peter uh, saw in a dream or in a vision uh, this uh, sheet that was let down by the four corners with all kinds of creeping beasts and animals in it. And the voice from heaven saying, rise, Peter, slay and eat. But Peter says, no, Lord, because I've never eaten anything unclean. And this happened continuously until he woke up. He realized that later on, as he related to the council in Jerusalem, that God showed him that we should not call anyone unclean that God has made clean. And we know that God makes all men clean who come to know Christ Jesus as personal Savior and who have been washed in the blood of what we call the blood of the Lamb. And so we see that God is no respecter of person. And if you're sitting out there and you've not really made a commitment to Jesus Christ because you think you're not worthy, perhaps you think you've done so many bad things that God cannot forgive you, uh, but we're told in 1 John chapter 2 that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And all means all. There's not a sin you can commit that God cannot forgive you for because the blood of Jesus Christ is just that powerful. And finally, the message of reconciliation is the gospel, resulting in one body, as I said before. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, it says this, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. For the Jews are Greeks, for the slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. God made no respecter or difference of persons. When the spirit is poured out, he's poured out on everyone who believes. No matter who you are, no matter what you've become or what you've done, the Spirit of God will indwell you when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Now, we need to understand something. We're not counting on a religion to save us. We're not counting on the Ten Commandments to save us. Neither are we counting on our denomination or our church to save us. But our salvation, our reconciliation is founded in one person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Paul encouraged the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, where we find the actual message of the gospel. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And so we find that Jesus Christ is our only hope. Regardless of what religion you are today, no matter what your friends say about you, you may even be an atheist, but you will not spend eternity in a very good place if you do not receive Jesus Christ into your life as your personal savior. You must make that choice. You must make that decision. Reconciliation cannot happen unless, first of all, we reconcile ourselves to God who believe in the gospel message, and then we have the grace, we have the mercy and the compassion to be reconciled to our brothers and our sisters who we think have wronged us. And some of those wrongs may indeed be real, but we must take the initiative as God did because we wronged God. God did not wrong us, but he took the initiative to come to us and to bring us to himself through Jesus Christ when he hung and died on the cross. And he verified his satisfaction by raising him three days later from the grave to be alive forevermore. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Everyone before him uh, had to die, but they had to be raised after Jesus Christ was born, uh, after he was raised from the dead. So we want to let you know that you cannot get there without Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Not only is it established in a person, but it's established with power. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, it says this as the disciples were pondering what to do next. Jesus said this in verse eight, Acts chapter one, verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Power that came to them on the day of Pentecost that's recorded for us in Acts chapter two is still empowering the church. And believe you me, even though there are some churches that are growing dark, the power of God has not gone out. That's right. the, the power of God rests and resides in these bodies of believers. Uh, the spirit makes his home within us. And yeah. so he's always ready. He's always available and he will never say no when we want to do and accomplish God's will. So it's established in a person and it's established with power. And finally, this is the challenging part. 
It's been given to human beings. Y'all say amen. amen. Because we are to promote this gospel. Mm -hmm. And Paul says this to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure that is the gospel message mm -hmm. in earthen vessels so that the, per, per, the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Mm -hmm. He gives it to you and me. Yeah. Most of us on the surface would think that God is taking a big risk, but no, God knew what he was doing yeah. because once we have met the challenge of faith and believe that Jesus was the son of God, that he was the savior of our souls, and we confessed our sins, we repented and asked him to be our savior. God knew that he was going to dwell with inside of us so that we might be able, even though we are in these vessels of clay, even though we are fallible, even though we are corrupt in many ways, God's spirit is still faithful and he stands ready to challenge and to bring us to points of reconciliation so that people might know that God is a God of peace. Yeah. He's a God of love. Mm -hmm. He's a God of mercy. And above all, he's a God of grace, not giving us what we deserve because justice, justice wants us to pay for our sin. Yeah. But mercy through the grace of God says, no, mm -hmm. man can't accomplish this, but I can. Amen. And he did it on the cross of yeah. Jesus Christ. And so finally, in conclusion, I would say this. Scripture has given us all the information we need to understand and apply the ministry of reconciliation. It began in the heart and mind of God, promised to mankind in the Garden of Eden, passed on and covenanted with Abraham, passed down to 42 generations of Israelites, and found in its ultimate conclusion in the offering of Jesus, God's only perfect son, to make it a spiritual reality. So our message of hope today Echoed by Paul is this, be reconciled to God. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for loving us so much that you paid the full penalty of the price for all that would believe. Now let us who have made that decision, who are living according to that choice, guide us that we might bring reconciliation to our divided nation, to our divided cities, to our divided homes, to our divided churches. Help us to take the initiative to begin the spiritual healing that needs to take place in our world around us today. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. May God bless you and may God keep you. Thank you for your patience, your consideration and understanding. Thank you.